Hey, what's up everybody? It's a me, Yemi the Ferret here with another episode of Yemi Cast. It's a Sunday, Sunday, Sunday edition because we're going over our top 10 video games of 2019. Ho, 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 ho. Uh, not yet though, not yet. So hold off on the applause. I just plugged in my applause button. So wait, hold off on the applause. That was a funny joke, Yemi. So before we go over the 2019 games, game top 10 games from me for the year, let's go over all the things that happened at the Game Awards 2019. If you did not, if you did not know, I streamed the Game Awards on my Twitch, Yummy the Ferret, Twitch, Twitch.tv/slash Yummy the Ferret. Make sure if you haven't followed me, go ahead and follow me on there. That's where I'm going to be doing a majority of my streaming, as you all no 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 no. It was a great stream. A lot of people came around and had fun with me. Uh, Chop the Dog won the free Steam game, which has been emailed to him. Uh, he won Don't Starve Together. So congratulations to you, Chop the Dog, and thank you to everyone else who was there for the live stream, including um, Dave R., or just Dave, uh, The Punisher, Callus, and uh, I think Kane's showed up. There was a guy named Three Million and Three. Um, so, yeah, it was a fun time, and I'm glad that, uh, we, we did it. It was a lot of fun. I stayed up way too late, but, hey, that's, that's just what you do for the people you love. All right, so let's talk about the Game Award winners, and then we'll go over what was announced at the Game Awards, and I'll give my thoughts on that. So, uh, we'll go, we'll start with the least important things and go to the most important things, or just, we'll go from bottom to top. This thing has the, this article has the game of the year at the, at the first thing, but we gotta build up that, you know? Don't skip. I see your button over the skip button. We're gonna go through this really fast. So, the best action adventure game. In this category, there was a lot of games that I thought could have won it, including Borderlands 3 and Resident Evil 2, but Sekiro ended up winning that one. Best game direction. Death Stranding won for Best Game Direction, which I was thinking Outer Worlds or Wilds was, or I'm sorry, Resident Evil 2 was going to win that one, or Control. Best Independent Game, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world filled with lots of good independent games this year, Disco Elysium won the Best Independent Game, which I have not played yet, and I put it on my wish list. Best Role-Playing Game, Disco Elysium took that one as well. I'm surprised Outer Wild Worlds didn't win that one, but what you gonna do? Uh, the freshest indie game was Disco Elysium. They won two or three of those awards. Player's Voice. Was, the winner of that was Fire Emblem Three Houses. The best performance was Mads Mikkelsen from Death Stranding. The best VR game was Beat Saber once again. Best ongoing game was Fortnite once again. Best multiplayer game was Apex Legends. Best mobile game was Call of Duty Mobile. Best sports and racing game was Crash Team Racing. Best family game was Luigi's Mansion 3. Uh, games for Impact. Gris or Grice. I don't know how to say that one. Best action game was Devil May Cry 5. Best art direction was Control. Content creator of the year was Michael Shroud Gretzky. Gretzky. Best strategy game was Fire Emblem Three Houses. Best audio design was for Modern Warfare. Best fighting game was Smash Brothers. Uh, best narrative was Disco Elysium. Best score was Death Stranding. Best community support was Destiny 2. And then the game of the year was Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, which a lot of people were very, very angry about in the Twitch stream, the Twitch chat. Uh, just after the show ended, everyone was like, I wasted three hours of my life, blah, 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 blah. It's like, ah, whatever. I, I really wasn't um, 
expecting Sekiro the win. I don't think really anyone was. It was a game that was on there that I was like, oh, you know, I played a little bit of it, but I didn't play enough of it. And I think a lot of people were that same way. But a lot of From Software fans probably came out of the woodwork and, and voted a bunch. And that's probably why Sekiro rose to the top. I was not I was not expecting Death Stranding the win or Smash Brothers. Uh, I was expecting either Control, Resident Evil 2, or Outer Worlds to win. And even in those three, I was expecting either Control or Resident Evil 2, just because they're two of the more popular games this year. And Control has a pretty interesting, you know, style to it and stuff like that. So, uh, but Sekiro won, which is which is great. I I actually really liked that, um, and I, I think it was a real like a big surprise. Vin Diesel said, you know, was up on stage and he was like, the Gudo. <laughs> and uh, there you go. Everyone kind of blew up. Uh, but it's co- good for them. This is the first From Software game to win game of the year. So congratulations to the Gudo. Shadows died twice. The one thing that I was kind of n- not liking about the Game Awards is some of these um, some of these categories, they just kind of like went over in passing. So like during the pre-show, there was like three or four awards given away. And not all of them you would actually give a trophy to people, which is very strange. And then during the Game Awards themselves, there was a bunch of ones that were given away in the same way. But the people didn't even accept the awards. They didn't come up on stage or come over to the guy who was to get to golf Kay- Kaylee. And, and it was just so weird. It was very strange. Uh, there was a lot of, like, c- commercial breaks in this one. Um, and there was also a lot of, like, things that I feel like could have been shortened or cut down a little bit. But overall, I was really enjoying it. And to be honest with you guys, it's it's great. It, it, it was a good a good experience. It was a good experience. I'm not angry about any of this stuff. And I got a few of my predictions correct. Um, so I, was, I, I predicted that Destiny 2 would be the best uh, community support game. I predicted that Death Stranding was going to get the best score in music. Uh, I predicted that uh, Modern Warfare would get the best audio design. Uh, I also predicted that the best... No, I did not predict that one correctly, I don't think. Um, I didn't get best action game either. Games for Impact, I did not get that. Um, Best family game, I I think I said in the podcast that I thought Luigi's Mansion 3 was going to win, but in the end I decided Super Smash Bros., so I didn't get that right. A best sports game, I guessed Crash Team Racing. Best mobile game, I guessed Call of Duty Mobile. Uh, best multiplayer game, I went, I did not get that one. Um, best ongoing game, I didn't get that one either. I did, I did guess the best VR game correctly, Beat Saber. Um, let's see. I also think I got, I think best game direction I got as well. I think I said Death Stranding on that one in the end. Um, but I didn't get any of those. But I mean, hey. I, I did pretty well to say to say so myself. So, <clears throat> what was announced during the Game Awards? Uh, there was a few things that um, stood out to me. <clears throat> One of the first things was this game called Godfall, and I thought it was uh, Warframe when it first showed up, uh, but it was Godfall, <clears throat> and it's gonna be and it's officially been announced to come out on the PS5. The trailer was pretty slick. It had like this guy in a lion suit uh, and two other characters along with him. No gameplay or anything like that, but it did look like an interesting concept, and I'm excited to see where that's going to go. They said it's going to arrive on Sony's next generation console at launch on holiday of 2020. So you won't be able to play it on PS4, I believe. Then also, Microsoft revealed the Xbox Series X, which looks like a rectangle version of the Xbox One. Um, it's definitely kind of mirrored after a PC and people are predicting, uh, on Twitter and stuff like that, that there's going to be like three or four different versions of this, of this console, uh, with, you know, varying, uh, amounts of, uh, like handling and graphical quality and stuff like that. Uh, so the series X is probably going to be the best one out of them all. Uh, and people are, of course, shitting on the name. Me, myself, I did too. I mean, it's just like the Windows 10 debacle. This is Xbox Series X, so this is Xbox Series 10. They just went from, they went from nothing, X, you know, the, reg- the original Xbox to 360 to 1, and now they're going to 10. Very interesting. I was really hoping that they were going to call it Scarlet. I felt like Scarlet's a pretty fucking badass name, but of course, their whole thing about it is green, so they could have been like, Xbox Neon, mm. <laughs> anime i don't know but yeah along with that and this is probably the bigger thing out of the the story that i was that i was really excited for there's going to be a hellblade senua's sacrifice sequel and i believe it's launching on the console 
It's called Senua's Saga Hellblade 2. And there you go. Um, people aren't expecting it to launch immediately on Sony consoles. Um, I believe it was a PlayStation exclusive last time when Senua Sacrifice came out, but I believe I, I didn't didn't Microsoft buy the studio or something like that. I don't remember what exactly happened, but still amazing. It looked fucking insane, and I'm guessing that they really improved the combat system in it because that's one of the things I had a lot of trouble uh, with in the first game. So I'm 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 really have high hopes for Senua Saga Hellblade Two. It's I think it's gonna be pretty badass. So. That's one reason to buy the Xbox One X, Xbox Series X. I'm probably going to be calling it the Xbox X. It just doesn't roll off the tongue, you know? Xbox X, Xbox Series X. Lots of, nah, I'm, I'm starting to foam at the mouth just trying to do it. Ah! Uh, anyways, also, Ghost of Tsushima has a 2020 uh, release date and a big reveal trailer. Uh, it was pretty darn good, if you ask me. Uh, so this, this one's being made by Sucker Punch, if you don't remember. And they said summer of 2020 is when Ghost of Tsushima is launching. So I'm guessing this is going to be the last big PlayStation exclusive before the PlayStation 5 comes around, which is probably going to be late summer, early fall, I'm guessing. And then winter, or maybe even into winter. Who knows? But I'm guessing Ghost of Tsushima is going to be the last PS4 exclusive. Uh, of course, it will be available probably in, with backwards compatibility on the 5. But yeah, the, the trailer was awesome. It looked really, really cool. And funny story, throughout the whole uh, show, and I probably should have told this story when I was going over the game of the year, but um, there was, like, leaves falling around. And I was like, oh, leaves. Sekiro, there's a lot of imagery with leaves and stuff and the concept art and stuff like that. I bet Sekiro's won game of the year, and they're going to release the leaves when when they, when they announce the game of the year. And I was really, like, I, I had that in my mind. My mind. And then they released the leaves with Ghost of Tsushima. So the Game Awards Orchestra did really, really well in this, um, and I, th I think they did a great performance. And it was a cool visual to see the leaves falling down around them as they played. Uh, and then, like like I said, I, I I was guessing Sekiro the whole time because there was leaves falling from above, and I was like, oh, it's gotta be, it's gotta be. Uh, and then I changed it at the last minute because I I was like, oh, it's gotta be Death Stranding though. People people are gonna get the Death. No, it, it was Sekiro. So cool news. Ghost of Tsushima uh, looks like it's gonna be kind of like um. Was I guessing like a For Honor type style, except maybe more intuitive, maybe more like a Nio or Neo? Uh, but yeah, the visuals and everything look really good with it, so it, I'm excited for that. I definitely am excited for that. And probably my favorite thing from there was the announcement of The Wolf Among Us 2, a Telltale series, which is coming uh, next year, I believe, or starting development. Uh, and it looks great. <laughs> they didn't show much off about it, but let me tell you guys, as soon as you heard Snow White's voice, I was like, it's Wolf Among Us 2, and then the visual style came in. Oh, it looks so good. Uh, I can't wait for Wolf Among Us 2. Wolf Among Us 1 is an instant classic. It's one of my favorite games from that year. And, uh, I believe, didn't WB buy Telltale, so that's why they, they came back. Um, and yeah, we're getting, we're finally getting the Wolf of Mice 2, which was originally supposed to release like in, what was it, 2018, but it was canceled. And now it's, it's finally back. I'm excited. Are you guys, I'm, I'm stoked. You guys know I'm stoked. Wolf of Mice 2, definitely on my list. And a new game from the creators of Dishonored, uh, they're in, so it's called Weird West. And the interesting thing about this studio is they broke off from, I believe, Microsoft or something like that. And their, their new, um... Their new name is Wolfi, and uh, they're being it's being published by Devolver Digital. It still has a Dishonored look to it, but the game looks drastically different. It's like a top-down kind of like RPG kind of game. The visuals that they showed look really good. Um, I'm just not sure if the game's gonna be fun or not. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see on that one. It's definitely not gonna be anything like what they've created in the past between like Prey and Dishonored. So uh, there you go. Also. Oh boy, this was a this was a shit show. The Fast and Furious Crossroads. Uh, so this was the last thing that was like an exclusive for the Game Awards, and it was the worst thing I have ever seen. The graphics looked bad, the character stylings, the hair and stuff like that all looked bad. It was just like a train wreck, and I was like, they're showing this off as the last thing. This looks like crap. Vin Diesel looks like an egg. <laughs> Oh my gosh, so that's going to be coming May 2020 alongside the release of the next movie. 
And it just it just looks bad, guys. If you want, you can check out the 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 reveal trailer on the Fast and Furious uh, YouTube channel. Um, and I just I, I I'm over it. <laughs> I'm over it. It just looks that bad. It just it really does look that bad. And I have nothing really to say about it. It just doesn't look good. Uh, also, Green Day is coming to Beat Saber, and the song pack came out the day of the Game Awards. Um, the funny thing is. Uh, Green Day, they opened up with uh, Oldie, Paradise, on their first album, Dookie. And I, I was really excited. I'm like, oh, they're playing the old stuff. And I was like, I hope they don't play the new stuff. And then what do you know, the next song, they played two songs. The next song came out and they sing like something off, like a single from their new album. It was bad, guys. It was so bad. Can I play a little bit? Okay, so that, that's all I can really play. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was bad. It was bad, but they announced, they didn't actually announce. It just came up on the screen as they walked off the stage that Green Day was partnering with Beat Saber, and there'll be a pack on um, on Beat Saber today. So, cool beans, I guess. Also, uh, C- Control's first DLC is coming in March 2020. Uh, I believe it's co- or the Expeditions update is out now, which I believe helped some core things with the game. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's going to be a new DLC coming in 2020. It's going to be, uh, I don't know. Okay. There's no price for it, but the update was free. So that's good. That's good. Uh, control. There you go. DLC. And, uh, the final fantasy seven remake also got a new trailer. Um, I was expecting them to be like, ah, we were just kidding about the episodic thing. Uh, this is coming out all at the same time, but nope, they did not do that. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. So let's go over the top games from you guys that you guys wrote to me on Twitter. So first up, we have a Joyful Death. And Joyful Death said that her two top games this year were Remnant from Ashes and Blair Witch. I did not play either of those games, but I've heard good things. I do have Blair Witch on the PC. I just haven't gotten around to playing it. Callus from Just Callus. <laughs> Callus, uh, he says that Super Mario Baker 2 is his favorite, which I'm guessing he means Super Mario Maker 2. But, you know, it's Callus. He's funny. He's funny like that. Bake me a pie, Callus. Bake me a pie and uh, make it blueberry, please. Uh, Tim Rules. Uh-oh. He said Modern Warfare is the only recent release he's played, so it's probably his game of the year. So there you go. Uh, STH, Tim. Uh, SMH. <laughs> <laughs> uh coco gamer says borderlands 3 so there you go cool beans i agree with that one uh depraved slasher never got back to me um so uh, sorry dude <laughs> can't say anything to you chronoside of course says super mario maker 2 it's a huge shock it rocked the world uh, i believe the earthquake was a 2.6 Pixel X says Fire Emblem Three Houses was her favorite game of this year. Uh, da, 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 Varric. Varric says that it would be Sekiro. Sekiro is his favorite game. Sinister Gaming says it's either Borderlands 3 or Monster Hunter Iceborne. Very nice. Uh, Shinobi Nando says Resident Evil 2, the remake. Loopy Lugs Gaming says Resident Evil 2 as well. Chop the Dog says Borderlands 3 or Outer Worlds. Scouse Mouse says Sekiro, which is just ahead of Mario Maker 2. Uh, the NES Sologist says Sekiro is most deserving. Luxon says Vendetta Online. Not sure what that is. Um, Razor's Edge. A.K.A. Jim says Kenshi, which is a indie game. The Splat Beef says Super Mario Maker 2. Uh, Loyal Maker 2, A.K.A. Alex, says Super Mario Maker 2, Resident Evil 2, Fire Emblem, Borderlands 3, and much more. However, Sekiro is his top from his perspective due to the story, mechanics, and it was really fun to play. Draco Evolved says Sekiro. And Red Ruger 
says Dark Souls 3, because he played it this year. So there you go. Cool beans for all those people. Um, yeah, so uh, what was your favorite game of this year? Let me know in the comments below. And if you missed my tweet, well, too bad, guys. Uh, too bad, so sad. All right, here we go. We are we are booting up my top 10 games of 2019, y'all. Here we go. Are you ready? Let me hear it. The top 10 games of 2019 by Yummy the Ferret. What's going to be the game of the year? We had a lot of predictions, guys. We had a lot of predictions in the Discord. Thank you to everyone who tried to predict it. There were so many different predictions. The one that I saw the most was Borderlands 3. And in second place was... Um, Outer Worlds? No, Death Stranding. Death Stranding was in second place. And there was singles for everyone else. So thank you to everyone who tried to win the Game of the Year giveaway. Let's see if anyone got it right. Let's see if anyone got it correct. All right, so starting off with number 10. And number 10 is... The world, twice destroyed, lies in ruins. If we are to survive, if the world is to blossom again, then we must find the one who is Rad. Righteous. Foul beats. Mutation. 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 Tight. child shows promise, but the time has come for their real quest to begin. You are Rad. That's right, number 10 is Rad, coming from Double Fine, right? Double Fine? Uh, Rad was a bit of a surprise to me because it was something that I don't normally play, which is a top-down, beat-em-up type survival game. And every time you die, well, guess what? You have to restart the entire game, which gets a little frustrating, which is why it's so low here on the on the scale here. But it's still a really fun game to replay, go through again. It has a really nice story to it. The graphics really look really nice. It has a nice 80s vibe to it, which is mm, a wee chef. I love that. And also, throughout the game, you'll get mutations. That's right. You'll get, mute like, wings. You can get wings. You can get a buddy that shoots acid every so often you can get the ability i mean it's just so many different things you can get out of this game and of course there's weapons you can find and stuff like that the only thing is i really really wish there was a way to not have to restart the entire game when you die uh that's one of those things that kind of brings it down for me but it is a really cool concept you're trying to regrow the earth so everywhere you step you have plants grow like grass grow and stuff like that and there's lots of stuff hidden away there's a lot of cool things to find if you haven't checked out rad Make sure you check it out. It's a really fun game, and uh, I give it number 10 on this list. Uh, it just, it's just a fun game. It's just fun, uh, and it, like I said, it can get a little frustrating at times. It can get a little repetitive, but you know what? I forgive it for those two, two things because it is a pretty fun experience when not done in three streams in three days. <laughs> I haven't actually gotten back to Rad. I probably should. Uh, I got pretty far the last time I was doing it, and it's it's one of those it's one, it's one of those things where you kind of get scared to continue on because you're like, oh, if I die, you know, after coming back to it, that's gonna suck. But it's like the more you wait, 
the uh you know the the, the more of a chances that you die so i, I don't know guys <laughs> Okay, coming in at number nine is... That's right, Hot Lava, coming in at number 9, a Steam game, uh, which is better to play with a keyboard than a controller. Hot Lava takes everything you love about the childhood game, The Floor is Lava, and turns it into a merriment of joy in a video game. If you don't recall, this really th takes me back to the Call of Duty jump servers, back with uh, Call of Duty 1 and United Offense. A lot of people hear me talking about that, and you know what? It was a great time in gaming when the modders were just all over those games. And you'll never see those kind of things again, but you can get close, like with Hot Lava. I think Hot Lava really stood out because of that fact that it was just so nostalgic for me to play it. Jumping around on things, doing parkour and stuff like that. It was more in, you know, it had more to do than like a Call of Duty jump server. Um, but the, the level designs are great. The, um, the difficulty does rise with each area you go to and it's it's it gets, it's got a few collectible things in there lots of fun there uh the only thing annoying about the game is that every um every area has a marathon one and by the time you get to like the third and fourth area the maps are so long and you just don't want to do them that it, it gets a little annoying and the chase the sister sections i don't really like either but the majority of the game is really really fun and i really commend the developers for making such a fun and addictive game Hot Lava, guys. Check it out on Steam. Uh, tell me what you think of it. The parkour is pretty good. Uh, there's only one mechanic that I think is a little bit lacking, and that's the sticky putty on the wall. I just, I never can seem to get that right. And I don't know if it's just me being a stupid noob, or if the game just kind of doesn't know the physics correctly, but I, I don't know. I'm going to blame myself on this one. I'll give them a pass. But yeah, coming in number nine, Hot Lava. And what's... Number eight. We've lost. The Empire's hunting Jedi survivors. Now, they know who you are. I can't change the past. You trespass, Jedi. But I'm done hiding. Cal Kestis. We will always struggle. It's the choice to keep fighting that makes us who we are. That's right, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order comes in at number 8 on the Game of the Year list. Oh my gosh, Fallen Order was an excellent experience, only marred by glitches <laughs> and uh, some uh, some things that I just thought were was a little messy. 
and I know they'll probably fix these issues that I have with it while the game progresses, but it seemed like each planet kind of had its own problems. Frame rate drops, being able to look through the map, it's just, just, just things that just weren't adding up, things that weren't working as well as they should. Uh, especially on Kashyyyk, there's areas where I would walk into the area and there would be nothing there, or I would spawn into an area and there would be nothing there. Uh, and you had to wait like a minute or so for everything to load in and for the textures to render, and it just... It was that kind of sloppiness that kind of brings it down, in my opinion, but the story is excellent, and it's canon, uh, and it really leaves it open-ended for another game, which is exciting for me and probably a lot of people as well. The ending, which I won't spoil, is fucking amazing. Um, it's just It wasn't expected. You know, I wasn't expecting that to happen, and it did, and it was really awesome. Uh, and the game has a lot of collectibles and stuff like that to get, a lot of customization you can get for your lightsaber and stuff like that, which is, of course, like, a, a, a the best thing to have in one of these games. So, uh, it, it, you know, if, if you're a fan of Star Wars, but you're scared of Dark Souls-type games, this one is a pretty light Souls-like experience. It's very forgiving. Uh, it still has those mechanics of a Souls-like game and enemy placement of a Souls-like game. But, it's like I said, it's very forgiving, and, it'll, you know, you can, you can probably cruise through this game with hardly any problems as long as you stay on the main path. The one thing I will say about it as well, if you go off the main path and you go somewhere else, things can happen... Uh, like, I remember, uh, I was on Zepho, and I accidentally ran into a bounty hunter who took me down, and they took me to this area, and I believe I was supposed to go to the ship, and then do something on the ship, and then they're like, go here, and I would go there, and then I would get captured. I don't know, though, because I haven't played through the game again to know if I did something wrong there. Uh, but it was like an instant takedown for that bounty hunter, so I, I think that was like a planned out, kind of scripted moment. But, of course, I missed some story elements because when in the cutscene after I did all that, the, all the characters were, like, you know, tr saying they were sorry. And, oh, my God, we, oh, I'm so sorry. And I was like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> like, did you send me here because you thought something was here? Or, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> but it was cool. I really enjoyed the game. Some of the puzzles in the game were really fun to solve. And, damn, if there's not a lot of collectibles in this game, a lot of crates to open, I'm still searching for them. I'm thinking of going for the platinum on it, but... I don't know. We'll, we'll wait and see on that one. I'm hoping there's like a little bit of DLC maybe for it, a new planet to explore or something like that. Uh, and I'm really hoping that there's going to be another Fallen Order game in the future. All right, let's move on to number seven. That's right, number seven is Katana Zero, one of the best indie games of this fucking decade. This game is so stylized, so fucking lovely. The soundtrack, the gameplay elements, everything about it is just so amazing. The story in the game is so interesting and unique. It's crazy how good this game is. There's different paths you can go in this. There's different ways you can go progress through the story. The stealth elements and all like uh, and everything like that is like a two D. Uh, it's like a. It's kind of like um. It's kind of like um. Uh, what's it called? Uh, 
what is it called? I don't even remember. It's kind of like those games where you kind of bust into a... It's like a top-down view and you bust into a room and you shoot guys up, except it's more... It's from the, like, 2D side-scrolling perspective, but it works really, really well. And like I said, the characters you meet and the story is just so good in this game. And if you haven't played Katana Zero, it's definitely an experience, and it's one that you should not miss. The only reason it's not higher on this list is because it's a relatively short campaign. I, I beat it in two sittings, uh, more like one and a half sittings, to be honest with you. And the replay value is moderately high on it, but there wasn't like enough to do in a replay that you know made me want to play through the whole game several times in a row. It's just it's a great game. If you haven't picked it up, make sure you do so. Uh, it's 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 one of those games that uh, is going to be an underrated classic. I can already tell. Uh, even though I got a nod at the Game Awards just by being in the category, I, d I don't think a lot of people played it. So if you haven't played it, make sure you check it out. All right, what's number six? Bada bing, bada boom. Borderlands 3 is number 6 a -roo. That's right. Um, I know this is going to be a shock to a lot of people, but Borderlands 3 just doesn't have the same charm as Borderlands 2 to me. I I can still go back and play Borderlands 2 for hours on end and not be uh, annoyed or bored, but I go back and play Borderlands 3, even with multiple characters, and I just feel bored while playing it. I, I, just, I feel like there's way too much of the just shoot through everything kind of mentality in this one and I think that the side missions really struggle in this game as well there's not as there's not many that I would say that I really really enjoyed I will say this though the story is really good um, there is some meaningless character deaths that I won't you know I'll, I won't like really go in depth about because they're spoiler territory the boss fights were pretty good for the most part but there were so many boss fights that were just like a, a, a like a jacked up version of a regular enemy. Like, the first enemy you face is just a is just a badass psycho. Uh, the second enemy, the boss you face, is is just a, a nog, but he's, he, you know, he's he's special, you know? the Some some more enemies down the line, there's the anointed Goliath, who you see a bunch of times after he gets a, it's, you know, it's just, it's one of those things that, like, Bad Maw from Borderlands 2 was the same way, but there were, like, hard, there was no other bosses in that game that were just souped up versions of a regular enemy besides from Bad Maw and the security drone thing that, that captures Roland. That's the only two bosses from that game that had anything to do with a regular enemy, to be honest with you guys. And even if you look back at Borderlands 1, same thing. Like, the, those characters are... The, those bosses aren't really like any of the enemies in the game, but in Borderlands 3, you just see so many of them. And it gets annoying after a while, because you're really hoping for, a, like, the next best boss fight, you know? Even though a lot of the boss fights were fun, especially the ones with, like, cameos from from uh, those magicians and stuff like that, they were uh, excellent boss fights, but there's all these other ones that just are, like, I, I, you know while you're fighting it that, yep, it's just a souped-up version of a normal enemy. You know, it's like fighting the security drone in Fallen Order for the first time. It's like, well, that was an easy boss fight, you know, because it was just a regular enemy with a health bar at the top of the screen instead of just over his head. So that's the, uh, that's just some that's just some of the problems I have with Borderlands 3. For the most part, though, excellent gameplay. The gunplay was definitely, you know, revamped, and it feels really good. The character abilities and stuff like that are badass. They all have unique abilities, and there's, like, several trees that you can go through on each character and level up. 
and it changes the way they can play the game. I went through the whole game with uh, the Beastmaster, and I got that Skag leveled up pretty high, guys. Iridium Skag is fucking amazing. Uh, I, I, I tried to mess around with a few different animals at, in the, at the beginning, and I've, I felt the best uh, with the Skag. And I've also been playing through it with Zane as well. And he's really fun to use. Uh, you can trade out his grenade for a like a drone that drops bombs on enemies, which is pretty fun. And also his doppelganger ability and his shield ability help a lot, to be honest with you. I, I usually go with the doppelganger one because enemies look at him. Uh, Moe's is really fun to play as, and so is Arma, Armura, <laughs> Armura, or whatever her name is. Uh, they're both really fun to play with. I just haven't played through their camp, camp campaign enough to really get a good feel for what they can do. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, it, it, the game is good. It, it's not the best thing ever. And on the rankings of Borderlands games, I put it just below Borderlands 2. You know, it, it, I, I think once the DLC comes out for Borderlands 3, maybe uh, it'll, it'll get me to go back to it and play through it more and maybe I'll enjoy it more. But it just, there's something a little bit different about the game, you know. It, it, it has more of like that pre-sequel feel to it with the with the with the missions and stuff like that. It just it's it's almost there, it, and it could have been better. Um, I just I, I can't put it higher on this list because when I go back and play it, I just feel so bored. You know, I I, I play through about an hour or something like that of the campaign, and I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> Like, I already know what happens to the campaign. I've already done pretty much 99% of the side missions that I can possibly do in my original playthrough. And unlike the other Borderlands games, I just don't have the will to get through all that stuff again. A lot of them are tedious, long, uh, useless, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a little bit annoying. But I do like what they did with this game. I do enjoy it. I like the graphics and everything like that. Just uh, I have a few complaints about it, as you can tell. So that's why it's not as high on the list as some of the other things on this list. Uh, speaking of other things on this list, great segue, Yummy. What's number five? This is not how I imagined my first day. Due to the citywide outbreak, you are advised to take shelter at the Raccoon City Police Station. Free food and medical supplies will be provided to everyone in need. Something's not right. Stay back, sir. I got this. What the? Rookie, you save yourself first. Help me, please! What in God's name? Boom! Number five is Resident Evil 2, the remake. Yeah, boy! I never played Resident Evil 2. Shocking. It's on the PS1. I didn't I didn't have a PS1 back in the day. I have one now, of course. But I went back and played like Resident Evil 0 and the remake of the original Resident Evil. The tank controls just aren't for me. You know, I, I joked about it in my podcast. I did everything with tank controls in Grim Fandango. But you won't catch me dead doing tank controls in a Resident Evil game or like Dino Crisis or something like that again. Um, the Resident Evil 2 remake, remake took everything that uh, made Resident Evil 2 not uh, user-friendly to most people who didn't grow up in that era to something that is remarkably easy to pick up and play through. Uh, even like the the story elements and stuff like that, that you know, getting the secret endings unlocked and stuff like that, it was pretty easy. I I went through this game four times, once on each character's uh, story. Claire, and, I'm sorry, Jill and um, 
Leon. Gee, I almost forgot his name, Leon. And then I went through their second campaigns, and the difficulty does surge on their second campaign playthroughs. And there's um, there's like the fourth survivor too, which is a really fun game, like a really fun thing to do. It's a little, it's like a you know escape through the horde kind of game or, or kind of thing. Uh, getting all the bobbleheads gives you a, the unbreakable knife, but if you're not careful, you can lose it if you attach it into an enemy and don't pick it up. Mr. X is a constant nuisance, but also makes the game really intense and changes the game entirely. His reveal in the first section where Leon sees him is fantastic, and uh, he comes in much sooner in in um, Jill's yeah Jill's playthrough, or is it Claire? Wait, I'm getting them mixed up now. I'm getting them mixed up. I'm stupid. Anyways, it, it's really interesting how the game works, and the graphics look amazing. They did such a great job putting everything in there. There's fun things to find, ammo to use. Uh, you, I, I went through, after I got the Unbreakable Knife, I tried to go through Leon's campaign with just the knife for, like, the first half of it, and it worked. It literally worked, and I saved so much ammo for, like, boss fights and stuff like that later on. And I even got trophies that I didn't think I would get, like beating the bosses in a certain amount of time. And by the time you get to the end of it and you've saved up all your stuff and you've defeated Mr. X fast, boom, you get the secret ending. Really cool stuff. Really cool stuff. And the other playthroughs of the game were really, really nice to do as well. If you haven't played Resident Evil 2 Remake, it's excellent. It's very user-friendly. It's kind of like um, Resident Evil 5 or Resident Evil 7 kind of mixed together in terms of gameplay-wise. It definitely has the Resident Evil style to it. It feels like a Resident Evil game. And I never played the, the original Resident Evil 2, but I've heard a lot of good things from people who have. It just, Like I said, it just makes it more accessible to people. You know, it's try and go back and play Resident Evil 2 without having ever played a Resident Evil game on the PlayStation 1, except for, like, maybe Resident Evil 5 or 4, right? Try and go back and play those games. It's just, it's hard to do, and it's not something that I'm going to invest my time into. But the remakes... Hell yes, I will definitely play those. I'm definitely getting Resident Evil 3 Remake when that comes out with Project Resistance. Gonna be pretty fun, guys. So yeah, Resident Evil 2, number 5. Moving on to number 4! Yep, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair is number four. This game, I had to make a whole podcast apologizing to Platonic Games because I judged this game before I played it. I judged their company before this game came out. The original Ukulele was a sore thumb in Platonic's, or uh, it was just a sore thumb in general. It was a bad game. It didn't. It didn't. It was supposed to be a rare revival. But it was nothing like that. The characters were mixed around, and there was just nothing going for it, in my opinion. Ukulele Impossible Lair fixes all of my problems with the game and adds this super fun and highly replayable experience like no other. It feels like a Donkey Kong Country type game, but it has elements from the Ukulele franchise. It's a 2D, uh, 
you know, side scroller with pu- not really puzzle elements, but but you, you you do some puzzles to find the coins and stuff in the game. But you know, and then the overworld is like a, a top down kind of thing with puzzles as well. It's just such a fantastic experience. Everything about the game is really, really well done. It has good pacing. The levels are so meticulously and well designed. And each level has an opposite level to it. You can unlock the opposite level by doing something in the overworld uh, or the hub world to make something change. Like there's one that's on a conveyor belt. And if you go into the conveyor belt the normal way, you know the conveyors are going one direction. And if you reverse the conveyor belts, guess what? Inside the level, the, the conveyor belts are reversed. There's other ones that change the level completely. Like there's one where... Um, it, I think it's the first one in the game where you can go into it. It's like the original level, and it's really easy. And then if you do something special, which I'm not going to spoil, uh, the level gets completely turned around. Like, there's no, there's nothing similar about the level, but it's such an interesting concept to have these changing levels. It takes that concept of adding pages to a book in uke- the original ukulele and making the level expand, and it takes it in a new direction and makes it really, really nicely. Platonic has already said that they want to continue stuff with ukulele, but they have other things that they want to do. And I feel like if they continue this impossible layer type thing, that's where they that's this is where they're 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 golden. I don't I don't 3D platformers, you can skip those if they're gonna be like ukulele. But the impossible layer, hell yes. Have I beaten the impossible layer yet? Hell yes. It took me a lot of tries, but I finally did it. It was so worth it. It was so satisfying to get to the end of that because it is such a hard freaking level. And getting the bees to protect you through it, you need as many bees as you can possibly get. And there's secret areas in the hub world that you can that you wouldn't be able to get to if you weren't paying attention, if you weren't collecting coins, if you weren't collecting feathers, stuff like that. Which is really, really cool. It really gives you a reason to go back and collect all the coins. Go back and collect as much, many feathers as you can. Plus, there's things that can make the game easier, especially if you have kids. You can add more checkpoints. You can make uh, them have one extra hit. You can make it so Laylee doesn't flail around as much when you get hit the first time. It's just such a great experience. And the music. Let me talk about the the music in this game. It's so well done. Each level has its own vibe, and it's so well done. Done. There's nothing that I can really say negative about this game. It's just so much fun. It's so good. It is so good, guys. If you have not checked out the Impossible Lair, you could you should probably wait for a sale because it's a little overpriced at forty dollars, but it's so worth it to me. And I bought it on a whim, going, I don't know if I trust Platonic, and I I shat on them so much throughout my podcast, and I just I had to take a whole podcast to go. I apologize to Platonic because this game seriously puts you back on my radar seriously redeem you've redeemed yourself with this every concern that i had with ukulele the original one it just they got fixed and it got better and i'm really happy to say that platonic is in my good graces again and if they continue this trend of good games hell yes they'll be they'll stay there uh ukulele impossible there two thumbs up that's why it's number four on the list all right let's move on to number three Untitled Goose Game comes in at number three. Of course, it comes in at number three. I just love terrorizing the people of this town. It is such a fun little puzzle game where you play as a goose who has hardly any abilities rather other than honking, flapping his wings, picking things up, and then crouching. That's really all you can do. And you can run, okay? And you can swim. But... This game is so well thought out. It leaves it so open-ended so that you can solve these puzzles in... Really, there's multiple ways to solve them. And getting this list done... There's a list for each area that has that you can check mark things off of. Getting that list done is so satisfying and it's so replayable of an experience. The graphics are cutesy and fun. This goose is 
fantastic. I love this goose. <laughs> I love this goose. And the levels are so well thought out, like I said. Like, each area has its own little vibe to it, and each area has all these different new puzzles that you can try and solve. It doesn't give you a lot of direction, but it does have things in place to kind of make you go, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. Oh, the guy trips over his shoelaces if you untie them. Oh, this guy drops this box, or, you know, sets down this box, and it has a little opening of it for me to get into. I can totally get into that and sneak into the area. Oh, I can push over this bucket. Oh, I can turn on this sprinkler. Oh, he'll go into the water and it'll check mark getting him wet. Oh, he'll bend over and I can grab his hat. You know, stuff like that. It's just, it's such a fun little game. It's so simple, but it's just so satisfying. If you haven't played Untitled Goose Game, it's going to be available for all different platforms soon. It's coming for the PlayStation later this month. And it's just such, it's it's so worth it to pick it up. If you're a trophy hunter, if you're a fan of puzzle games, if you just want to play something that you can chill out and just mess around in, this is the game for you. Untitled Goose Game is is the best indie game of this year in my heart. Well, maybe. Let's, let's see if there's something else higher on this list. But for right now, Untitled Goose Game has a special place in my heart. And I think that if you haven't played Untitled Goose Game... What are you waiting for? It's a fantastic experience. And the ending of it? Fucking hilarious. So fucking funny. This goose has been terrorizing these people for years. <laughs> so you kind of understand why they all kind of are like, no geese, please. So yeah, Untold Goose Game, number three. But what's number two? going on, eh? One question first. Are you feeling anything that can be construed as explosive cell death? No? Wonderful. Let's get started. Welcome to the edge of the galaxy, the frontier of space. Well, at least it was until the corporations bought it, branded it, and started selling it at ludicrously inflated prices. And the rest of your fellow settlers? Abandoned on the edge of the colony. I'd save them myself, but the board's got a bounty on my head. So, that's why I thawed you out. You appear capable. Look, I get it. Taking on the corporation has left us with two choices, bad and worse. But you have to choose. And you have to choose now. You know you didn't have to shoot either one, right? But it's fine, I guess. You just keep being you. Spaces Choice is not responsible for any feeling of vertigo, wonder, or hunger you may have experienced while watching this advertisement. Yep, Outer Worlds is number two on my list. This game by the same developer who did New Vegas. It feels so much like a Fallout game, but in space, and I love it. The sci-fi aspect of it makes this game so unique and fantastic. The open-ended ways you can just do objectives and stuff like that. You can literally shoot people, and the game will be like, Okay, well, uh, <laughs> here's your next objective. You know, here's what you can do instead. It's just, and the end of the game is so open as well. You can do so many different things. I saw a speedrunner who did, did who beat the game in 15 minutes, and at, at, to finish the game as fast as he could, he shot the groundbreaker into the sun. That's how you beat the game that fast. It's one of those things that you wouldn't ever think of you could do, but you can. The different factions, the, di the different planets, they all have like this, this really nice feel to them, this really cool aspect of them. You know, all the, all the background information you can get from this game, all the different characters you can meet and talk to in this game. This game doesn't tell you who's going to have a side mission for you. This game doesn't tell you where to go, really, unless it's a main objective. And then you get other objectives by talking to people. You get side missions by talking to people. Um, and you don't have to go to these people. You know, you could totally miss out on a lot of of these side missions if you just don't talk to people or you don't go in depth when talking to them. There's a guy on the on the docks in on the first planet who you really don't have to talk to, but if you go and talk to him, he'll give you this spiel about robots and how they're taking over the world and he'll tell you to go destroy a robot that he saw walking around and it sparks his whole freaking 
this this side mission that is is very lengthy for such a small little thing that to talk to someone. Uh, even though I have problems with like the facial animations and stuff like that, I feel like you know it's 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 pretty good for how big the game is, how wide the scope is on this game. It feels like a mix between Mass Effect and Fallout, and it's beautiful. It really is. Your companions are all so likable, and you can like you can literally tell people to fuck off. You know, when you first meet them, you could you could have no companions if you want to. Uh, the only reason I have all the companions with me is because I talked to all of them again. You know, I did stuff for them. And just like Mass Effect, they all have their special things that you can do with them. Uh, there's one that's a robot cleaning droid that has acid instead of cleaner, which is hilarious. I love that character. I have him with me all the time. Just some of these characters are really, really good. They go in depth in the story. And it's really something special um, to interact with them and stuff like that. And if you want to go through the game as a badass who just shoots everyone, you can do that. If you want to go through the game as a pacifist who doesn't do anything, you can try to do that. It's going to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, if you just want to kind of cruise through the game, not doing anything else other than the main the main thing, you can do that. If you want to go through the game as a stealthy, sneaky boy, you can. If you want to go through the game as an evil overlord, you can. If you want to go through the game as uh, pretending to be the captain of the ship that you took because you squashed him at the opening scene... With your escape pod, you can. You can literally say you're, you're Captain Hawthorne to everyone who you meet. And they'll be like, okay, you're Captain Hawthorne. It's, just, it's such a great game. And it's, it's, it's just the kind of game that really is something that I love to play. It's not too in depth that you need to learn about, you know, item rarity and, you know, oh, the, these armor mods and these, the, you know, it's all pretty easily well thought out. And there's not much that I can say that uh, is negative about this game. It's just, it's just a great game all over. Load times are a little bit long and facial animations are a little bit lacking. But for the most part, the amount of freedom you have in the game to, to kind of do exactly what you want to do, it, it just dwarfs everything else in this game. And. Uh, there's just the, the visuals, the graphical style, just everything about these planets just, just really speaks to me. And it's just, it's such a great playthrough and I, I can't wait to play through the game again. Well, y'all, it's that time to announce the game of the year from me, Yemi the Ferret. What's number one, editor, which is me, <laughs> Yep, that's right. If you've been listening to this podcast for this year, you'll know that Steam World Quest Hand of Gilgamesh is my favorite game this year since the middle of the year. Uh, I came out on Twitter and said that this was my favorite game of the half year when I did the half year roundup on Twitter. Every podcast I talk about this game, I have nothing but positive things to say about it. I bought this game physically to get the collector's edition 
after I bought the game digitally on the Switch. That's how much I love this game. I know a lot of you are going, oh, of course. <laughs> because you know that I've talked about it so much more than any other game throughout this year on the podcast. And to be honest with you, it, for good reason. The SteamWorld games have always had a special place in my heart ever since I played Dig, Dig 2, SteamWorld Heist, and then finally SteamWorld Quest comes around. And let me tell you guys, this is the best SteamWorld game that I have played yet. It is so fun, it is so imaginative, it takes the world of SteamWorld and turns it into a a turn-based card game. It, It just, it's so much fun, there's so much strategy to go into it, and it's it's just it's there's so many different locations and different characters you can meet and they're also unique and they're also likable. The comedy lands in the game and the serious parts land in the game as well. The turn-based combat is so fun and refreshing. It doesn't get monotonous in my eyes. The different puzzles in the game are really fun to, to figure out and do. And everything about the game is just so fun and and just so amazing. I, I cannot put into words how fantastic this game is. The soundtrack is great. I'd say it's better than in The Impossible Lair, which is pretty high on my list of soundtracks. It's just that good. If you have not played Steam World Quest, this is my call of action to you. It is 25 bucks on any platform that you want to. Pick it up and tell me that it's not a fantastic game. And if you say it's not, I won't believe you. This game has reinvigorated my love for turn-based action games. I have not played a turn-based game in so long, probably not since the third age, Lord of the Rings the third age on GameCube. That's how long it's been since I've really dived into a turn-based game. Yeah, I've played Pokemon. Yes, I've played Fire Emblem. But those games aren't as magical as Steam World Quest, The Hand of Gil Gamek. So unfortunately, no one won the Game of the Year prediction. No one is getting the game for free. But you may have a chance to win this game in the 100th episode of YemiCast, which will be a live stream, and you will be able to win this. I believe, yeah, I'm. you know what, I'm saying it right now. I will give this game out for free during that podcast. I will do it. So make sure you tune into that whenever that happens. But for the most part, SteamWorld Quest, great art style, great direction, great story, great characters, great combat system, uh, great open world. Well, not really an open world, but great level design, um, fantastic dialogue, uh, great music, uh, you know, a, a, a good store. It's a, it's a, got a competent store. Uh, just everything about this game is fantastic. When I first went through the game, I only used the main three characters. And I was like, oh, these are the best characters. I don't need to use these other ones. But in my next playthrough of the game, you know I'm using all the all the different characters I can. I really am. And these characters like that I didn't use in my first playthrough, they've opened up so many new possibilities. They're so much fun to just kind of mess around with your party and, and put in different characters and stuff like that. I really, really stand behind this game. And that is why it's my game of the year this year. It stands up there with the greats. And I know what you're saying. Uh... It's just an indie game, Yemi. How can you make four indie games be your top four games this year? Well, it's because the AAA games weren't really that great. Let's be honest here. What do I get to choose from? Anthem? Mortal Kombat 11? (laughs) You know? Death Stranding is just a walking simulator. I didn't play enough of World War Z. I thought Days Gone was boring and I didn't like it at all. Metro Exodus didn't play enough of that. You know? Greedfall was fine, but I wouldn't put it in a top 10 list. Because of Outer Worlds, Greedfall looks looks even less, you know? <laughs> it's still a great game, but, I, you know. Go off with your friends with a fun game, too. And, but it didn't have an official release, and even though I played it a lot this year, I feel like it didn't deserve to be on the list yet. Maybe next year. But th- th- these top 10 games are the games that impacted me the most this year. I played the most this year. And I liked the most this year. And it's it's my game of the year, guys. Not yours. So if you're frustrated or angry at me, just like you were frustrated and angry at the Game Awards for making Sekiro their game of the year, just remember that the most important game of the year is the one that you choose. Which is why I go out on Twitter and say, what is your game of the year? Because your opinion matters. Your opinion 
is your opinion. And if the game of the year is Sekiro to you, if the game of the year is Borderlands 3 to you, if it's Death Stranding to you, that's perfectly fine. That's your opinion, and I respect it. But don't get angry at my game of the year, guys. Don't get angry at my list, because this is my personal experience, just like your list is your personal experience. So take that with what you will. Take it to heart as well. And uh, make sure you respect everyone this year who's giving out their top 10 games. Just so that's all I'm saying. So well, thank you so much for joining me for this special event. Like I said, no one won the game of the year giveaway, but you will have a chance to win it in a few, uh, probably uh, about 10 episodes now, is it? So yeah, thank you so much for joining me for this premiere. If you're here for the premiere, if you're here on any of the other platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, or iTunes, nah, Apple Podcasts, or a replay of the YouTube stream, not stream, but uh, you know, podcast, I appreciate you too. Don't you worry. And I think that's it. So once again, thank you guys, and I hope to see you in the next episode, next live stream, next video, whatever. Uh, and uh, have a great day, guys. I am Yummy the Ferret, and this has been... Yummy Cast, a video game podcast. <laughs>